Good morning, everyone. Well, welcome to our third and final printmaking workshop um, offered by the Bruce and, uh, and Corinne Flax, the education director, and myself, Nancy McTagstock. Um, today, we are going to be uh, talking a, a little bit about Emily Mason's process as she grew more and more fond of the monotype process and other accompanying processes. So Emily Mason and multiple plates is really going to be our focus. And we're actually going to do some of these today. So the lecture portion will be a little bit uh, shorter than what we have done in the past. Uh, feel free to jump in if you have questions as usual at any time. As Emily began to enjoy printmaking as an arm of her studio practice, she was open to experimenting with a lot of different methodologies. Uh, one of the ways in which she further established uh, and embellished her prints was to use more than one plate on a print. This is often referred to as a multiple drop print. And this can be facilitated in any number of ways. Um, the most basic way to create one of these is to take a print that you have either just printed, uh, for example, any of the ones that um, you may print today, um, or one that you had previously printed, meaning one of the ones we had printed in previous weeks, or perhaps one that you might have hidden away in one of your um, <clears throat> print drawers. And the addition that you decide to add could be anything from color to more specificity or to textural elements such as collage. Uh, before we actually work back into some of your previously created prints, I'd like to briefly explain to you several of Emily's other techniques just for your own edification. I did touch on these last week um, and we will not be actually doing these processes. These would be fodder for uh, another workshop of this type. Um, they're not as simple to do at home, but, um, but I do think that you would find this of interest. So if you may recall, there are some, there's something called uh, carborundum prints. So my friend and master printmaker, Tony Kirk, introduced Emily to um, uh, carborundum monotypes in the 1980s when he was head of Tyler Graphics. Um, this is a process that she actually ended up using quite often. Uh, it's also a process that includes the use of finely ground silicon carbide particles known as carborundum. It's essentially a grit not dissimilar to how sand might look that's mixed with glue or sometimes people mix it with something like acrylic mediums. Um, that creates a fluidity uh, with this grit and enables the artist to actually paint um, with the carborundum to create a matrix that will be used in an addition of mono prints in this case. Now remember early on we spoke about the difference between a monotype and a mono print. Um, she often used this process because she wanted to create what we call an addition. And um, even though each one was a little bit different in her color choice or maybe some additional uh, embellishments, they all had a, uh, a matrix that was the same. And the matrix was created by the use of the carborundum. So um, the denser the areas of carborundum, the darker or more infused that area would become with ink. Uh, then the plate would be hand inked. Now that's not something that we've done. Uh, primarily because it's a process that's used primarily with um, intaglio techniques. And um, when you hand ink, there are several different ways that you can do that. 
you can take your ink and you can put it on a on a uh, on a plastic spatula and you can run it across the intaglio plate. Let's remember what an intaglio plate is. It's it's a it's a printing plate that has been incised. It comes from the word um, intagliarse, which is an Italian word which means to cut. So um, a dry point, an etching, a solar intaglio, all of these um, have been incised, if you will. So when you are putting ink on, you're not using a brayer per se. You really want to get the ink in and around into those uh, incised areas. So in order to do that, you need to do it by hand. Some people just do it by hand actually with their hands where they take ink on their gloved hand and they rub it all into all those little crevices to be sure that, um, uh, that the ink is imparted into those design uh, centric areas. Um, <clears throat> then the rest of the plate is usually wiped clean uh, like an etching plate would be. So that, that means all of the ink would really just be in those recessed areas. And in the case of the carborundum print, it would be tucked away in all those little grit and granular areas. Sometimes a second or possibly a third or fourth plate could further be added on top once the carborundum plate is printed. Uh, this will allow for further alterations of color and create an addition of prints of monotypes with that same matrix, but a little bit different in appearance. And as you may remember, we've spoken quite a lot about um, Emily as an intuitive painter and printmaker. And uh, so this process was really quite appealing to her and she continued to use it for years. Um, this image that's up on the screen right now is one called Ancient History. Now, in my, my research, I, I was trying to find something that uh, would relay a bit more of the process to you. Um, and I thought this was a good example. In this plate, you can see that, okay, it was a plexiglass plate, right? And then there were um, all different scattered bits of different degrees of darkness. So that was created, all those value changes and textural changes were created by the carborundum. Um, unfortunately, the uh, gallery that had this available on their website for me to view did not any longer have an image of the final printed piece, which was printed in color. But I felt like there were so many other examples that I could show you that I just wanted you to be able to see this because I think it could help you to understand that process of painting with the grit, if you will. Um, maybe when you were little, you did something called glue prints where you would take the bottle of Elmer's glue and you would go along on a piece of cardboard and you would let it dry. And then after it was really, really dry, then you took your brayer or, or, your, or your fingers and you put paint all around it and, and wiped it and then printed it. So in a very, very, very simplistic way, that glue print is not totally dissimilar to doing this type of process. Obviously this is a lot more sophisticated. So. Did she work um, from the dark colors to the light or the light to the dark? You know, that is a very, very, very good question to which I do not have the answer. <laughs> um, I didn't personally work with her. So, um, you know, I don't know what her uh, working process was. I can only find uh, bits of things from people who have worked with her. And um, so I am knitting this all together to create an overview for you. And Nancy, can I ask a question? Um, yes, ma'am. 
Uh, I'm sorry, I, I am on my um, uh, cell phone and I can't get the email, my image to appear. But anyway, I wanted to see you. I think, did I hear correctly that you said she would use several plates? Yes. Uh, so yes. How, did, how did, did she dampen the paper in, you know, before using the second plate or how yes. does it? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. When yes. you dampen it, it doesn't affect the colors that you already have on the paper? No, because um, you, if you had previously printed them with oil ink and they are now dry, they're not going to wake up again. It, it, you know what I mean? Oh, if you were using water-based inks, then that would be a whole different ball game because then, um, you know, those inks would definitely move around a bit. Um, Although there, there is a company called Akua who has now developed uh, an intaglio water-based ink. I, I personally have not used them, but I do have some friends who do use them. Um, so, so maybe I'm, I'm a bit um, confused um, about the, um, the um, need to dampen the paper. If it's oil, why do we need at all to dampen the paper? Only because it helps to wake up the particles. You know, when you're using the type of paper that we're using, the imported handmade paper, it's made out of 100% cotton. So just like if you were going to dye um, an, a, a, a t-shirt, let's just say, um, you would dampen it uh, before you put it into the dye vat so that right. it would further be receptive to receiving the dye. Right, right. So, um, so that's really the reason. The other reason is that depending on the papers, some papers have more sizing than other papers. And so it helps to uh, dispel some of that as well so that you can, um, you can get a deeper saturation. Okay, thank now, you. You're welcome. Now, keep in mind that if somebody is printing by hand um, and they are very heavy handed as, as a painter, um, they can very well print on dry paper because in all likelihood, someone using a lot of paint or a lot of ink, um, they would not bear, their print would not bear well under the pressure of printing because it would smush all over the place and it would smush out of the um, out of the perimeters of the plate. So let's let's um, look at these. She worked uh, with the solar plate etching process. I've had a lot of experience with that as well. Um, there's an artist named Dan Weldon who developed this solar plate process in the 1970s. Uh, the plates are actually an aluminum plate that's covered with a polymer that is um, UV, U, UVB reactionary. So um, you are creating an etching plate, but you are not carving anything. It's, a, it's, a, it's an easy process to learn. It sounds a lot more complicated when you try to explain it, but I don't wanna go heavily into the process with you right now because we're not gonna be doing this process. But what I did wanna do is I did want to show you two prints by Emily using the solar plate process because it will help you to understand a little bit more about a multiple plate drop. Um, um, Fareshta, can you see any of our slides or no? Um, yes, sorry, I can, I can see you, I can hear you, all of you, and I can oh, see good. the slides. And you can see the picture that I'm showing yes. right now? Yes. Oh, great. Okay, good, good, good. That makes me happy. <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. so <laughs> this particular one is called Magic Carpet. And this was created in 2010. Now, if you notice, there's, um, uh, 
there's a singular sort of carpet like flying carpet like image here. Um, and this is all done in like an indigo, a light indigo. Now, let me just show you this piece. Hmm. Now this piece is called Expectation and this was created in 2015, so five years later. So do you see that magic carpet from the magic carpet print? Yes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. that, so that is the matrix that was originated in this piece here. And then subsequently, she was able to create an addition of different prints, mono prints now they're being called, because why? Because they have a matrix in common. <clears throat> so, so the magic carpet is etching is by using an abrasive. It, it is, it was created by using the solar etching process. So artists can paint with ink onto an acetate sheet um, or they can use a photographic negative. And the only other supplies that are necessary for this process are a solar plate, the sun, or a UV light box, and ordinary uh, tap water. <clears throat> once once the, um, the plate is processed, not dissimilar to creating um, a print in a dark room, once this is created, she then will dry the plate and will be able to ink it up. And she can use the solar plate alone, like she did here in her first go around with the solar plate process, or she can use another plate in tandem with that. Uh, to create a series of images that maintains that specific central image, yet it appears to be different. So oftentimes the plates subsequent to the first plate printed are created using more transparent inks. Uh, while some inks are inherently more transparent just due to the pigment um, itself, others are thinned down with plate oil or with something printmakers called transparent base, which actually reminds me of an antibacterial ointment in the way that it looks. <laughs> and that's then mixed into the, uh, the ink color and it will make it a little bit more transparent if that's what the artist chooses to do. Does it so, luminosity to the final product using this trans? Transparent base? It can. It can. Yeah, it can. <clears throat> so this image was called Untitled. This was created in 1985, and this is was uh, designated as a monotype. So let's just imagine that you were going to print this. And let's sort of dissect one way in which this could have been printed, okay? So first of all, if you notice, this print shows a diversity of color as well as some intended edges. If you'll notice the backdrop is brown and it offers soft edges of color while the fuchsia and white offer more definitive edges to the shape, right? Mm -hmm. So although this prints uh, could have, although this print could have been created in a number of different ways, ranging from solar etching to carborundum, let's just examine it as if this was something that you wanted to make at home with just your plexiglass plates and multiple drops. Okay, so first you could roll out the brown background, then you could add in that richer brown, perhaps um, using some ink or paint that was slightly thinner 
um, and you could brush that into the other brown because it was darker. Uh, and, and, you know, that darker brown almost looks like it was brushed in or smushed in. It, it doesn't have any particular identifiable shape or pattern, right? Yeah. So then if you look at this, you notice that, oh my goodness, well, there are these really, really white areas and how could that have happened? Well, the areas that were white could have been created a couple of different ways. One way is it could have been created by placing pieces of cutout paper to act as barriers or stencils when you printed it. Or it's possible that the ink, that brown ink was all over the whole plate and in those areas where it's white and fuchsia that the ink was simply removed using alcohol. As you did a little bit of that last week and I demonstrated a little bit of that last week if you remember. Mm -hmm. um, so then the paper would be left to dry. Then once dry, a clean plate would be placed on top of that print. Next, the artist could take a Sharpie marker and outline the area. I'll show you, get my little trusty pen here. So let's just say that you have this brown and you have this white, right? And you can come through here and create this outline. We, we can't see uh, your what you're doing, Nancy. Can you see on the screen? Can you see the blue? Oh, no. yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, so you would create an outline like that, just with a Sharpie on, a, on the piece of plexiglass that you plan to use, okay? Now, that will give you the shapes and will enable you to place this properly. Now, what you would do next is you would take your plexiglass plate and you would turn it over on your table and you would place the fuchsia ink within, within these blue areas where you wanted it, um, but you're working on the opposite side. Now, why is that? because you're then going to flip it back over and you want, and, and you're gonna put it down on your existing print. Okay. So that way it will register or be how it needs to be positioned without you having to give a whole lot of thought to it. And I know this all sounds really complicated. Um, it's not as complicated to do as it is to explain. <laughs> if you were um, doing it by the white areas by uh, having the, a piece of paper down and, and, and rolling the brown over it, would you, would you want a lighter weight piece of paper uh, or would you want a heavier piece of paper or does it matter? It doesn't really matter. You could use anything from newspaper to um, newsprint, yeah. The idea just to create, you know, just to create a barrier. You could use mm -hmm. copy paper or you could use something heavy. You just don't want to use your good French or Italian paper. <laughs> um, so first she put the brown all over the paper um, transfer from the plate. And then with alcohol, she removed some sort of shape and then we go with, she went with the plate and outlined those and then put the pushy on the other side of the plate. Is that what she removed that by, by, by using alcohol, she removed it from the paper. She removed it from, um, she removed it from the plate and then she would print it and then she would print it. Oh, okay. 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 And, um, and then when she came back to do the fuchsia, um, she would wait most probably until the, uh, the underneath print was dry. And then she would put the fuchsia where she wanted that to go. 
Let me see. Um, so, you know, many of the multiple drop plate works um, were were done by her, and I I thought it might be instructive for you to have a little look at her working process. Actually, here are several photos that I borrowed from a short video from the Russell Janice Gallery in Brooklyn. Uh, Janice Stemmerman, who is one of the owners of the gallery, actually printed with Emily for over 20 years. And, and she uh, gave a talk um, along with several of the Bruce Museum curators um, and another printmaker last Thursday. Unfortunately, I, I couldn't uh, attend, but um, I thought it might be nice for you to see some images that she had in her video. So that I, you could I, attend, I attended that uh, event. It was really oh, yeah. Ooh, neat. Yeah. Oh, how great. Oh, was, how great. And, and there was someone else who worked with her closely. Yes, was, Lisa Mackey, I think. Yes, Lisa. Yes, I was so sorry to have to miss that, but I was doing a lecture the next morning and I was hard at work writing, <laughs> writing <laughs> my lecture. <laughs> but, um, but at any rate, here, here we go to this video. And, and maybe you even saw some of this video. Maybe they showed some of it, I, I don't yeah. know. Didn't. No, unfortunately. So here's Emily with one of her plates. And um, as you can see, she's sitting facing the window. So it's a great play way to work because she can see what she's actually going to get. She can see how opaque her ink is. She can see how transparent her ink is. She can see if the areas in which she wiped clean are actually really clean or not. Um, and here she takes a second print, I mean a second plate that has another bit of carborundum design on it. And she puts it in front of the former one. So here we have plate number one. Notice the sort of square, uh, clear area there, mm -hmm. the border around it. And here she puts another one in front. Now here she's planning out what she's going to do next, whether she likes these designs together, for example. So this is part of the multiple plate process as she used it. Here's Mary working carefully. As you can see, she has one plate underneath and she has another plate that she's currently working on, on top there. So obviously her plan is to use those two plates together. Well, of course, the plate underneath is dry already, right? Yes, yes. But it's a carborundum plate, so it has the image or matrix there. Okay. So all she, all she has to do is to ink it up again. Or perhaps she already printed that one and is, and is now working on the second plate. Yeah. So here you can see now, she's putting that second plate. Remember here, she had the blue underneath and she was working on it. Here's the blue, which had already been printed. And now she's putting another one on top. So this is called a multiple plate drop. And this shows um, what it's like when you're actually printing on an intaglio press, which of, of course is the most fun and gives you the most fabulous results. So you see she has one already, already printed that's on top there and she's getting ready to roll it down over the other one to add a little bit more fire to that green. She's gonna make it a little bit brighter with that yellow-orange, right? 
So uh, this here, um, as you can see, this video was created in May of 2015. It coincided shortly thereafter with uh, an exhibition um, at the Russell Janus Gallery. So I would encourage you to write this down. If you would go to www.russell, R-U-S-S-E-L-L, and then Janice, J-A-N-I-S dot com, and um, search on their website for the intuitive print video with Emily Mason. Okay, I think you'll really enjoy it. It's not long, but um, I, I think you'll find it just so wonderful to be able to actually see her in process working uh, and it will help to further inform you about her particular studio practice. So now let's have a chance to work on your multiple plate prints. So later, if we have some time, I would like to also show you a basic method to add some collage elements with rice paper, as some of you had requested, along with just a few things to think about for paper op options as you continue your own explorations in printmaking. So are we ready? Mm. Yes. Great. So what I thought we would do is a couple of things. I have um, <clears throat> okay, so here I have, this was a, a, a quick little print. I'm going to put, change my, my camera here. So give me just a moment. Bear with me for a moment while we get this in place correctly. Okay. There we go. Now we're in business. Okay. So this was an existing ghost print from a few weeks ago. So what I thought I would do is I would take this and let's just do a very simple additional plate drop on this. Okay. Now, of course, I have to have the same plate size that I used before. So I want to make sure that that is there, which it is. And now I'm going to figure out what I'm going to add um, and where I'm going to add it. So I think what I'm going to do is add a little bit of a um, lime green um, addition in this area in here. 
So let me get a Sharpie marker because I would like to show you that Sharpie process. <clears throat> okay, so I think, I think what I might like to have is maybe something coming over like this. Maybe something there. And maybe, maybe something coming in here. Okay. So now I'm going to turn this over. Remember I talked about how we're going to turn it over because um, I want to put my ink in these areas uh, so that I can then turn it over and it will print on the proper way. Okay. Now the other thing I want to do is this. I want to make little marks where I'm going to put my paper back so that it will be registered in the right location. Okay, so now I'm gonna take I'm gonna take this and I'm just gonna put it aside for now. I'm going to get my, my lovely green, which actually has a lot of oil already in it inherently. So I'm not gonna add anything to this. But I am going to follow this loosely. Now you can use um, a brush. You can use a Q-tip whatever you'd like to apply your paint with or your ink. Okay, so if I hold this up, I can see that it does have uh, some texture to it because of the brush and also because this is a thin uh, or more transparent paint. All right. So I'm going to just set this aside And I'm going to dampen my paper. Remember, this is a print that we had done before. And I am going to just lightly spritz both sides and wipe it just like I did before on my towel. Okay. So now I'm going to line up um,
I'm going to place this in the middle. And then I will line this up. And begin to make my transfer. So you can do this multiple plate drop process many times over. You're not relegated to, you know, just doing it once. So here you see I've added to that. So it has changed the space. Now, if I want to, um, Add another color. I can certainly do that. In the but you have to wait till it dries, right? You have to wait till it dries for another I, color. I I I I don't have to actually. I don't have to. Um, you know, I could put color in another place, and I'll show you. Particularly if it's going in a different location. Or if I wanted to, let's say I wanted to use these same uh, marks and I wanted to um, maybe make the color darker, for example, I could do that. I could just go ahead and paint over this and do the same thing again. Um, but what I would like to do, rather than go over this print again, is I would like to show you something called a glaze um, plate. Now glaze plate glaze plate is a little bit different. getting this nice and clean again. I'm gonna set this aside for right now. I just don't wanna run out of time today because I have a bunch of different things to show you, so. So this is a larger piece that we had done last week. If you remember, um, this went through several iterations and this was the final one that um, we ended up printing after using some solvents, if you may remember. Do you remember that? And we also used some paper towels and some brushes to create some additional types of textures. That's the one you said you liked the best. Yes, this is the one we said we liked the best. And now, scary moment, we're going to mess it up. <laughs> we're gonna jump out on a limb and 
see where this takes us. So once again, I'm going to just mark where my paper is. Now this one, I'm going to approach a little bit differently. This has a lot of pale colors to it. Um, and I'm going to be using a brayer for this process. And I'm also going to be using a little bit of plate oil for this process. So let me get, first of all, the right plate that I'll be printing with, the right size. Okay. I'm just going to now I'm just going to kind of mark off where I want this one basically to go. So in looking at this one, um, I can either go cool or I can go warm. Um, thinking what I might do with this one. Is I might pump it up a little bit and I'm going to use this color called intense Viridian. So I'm, I'm going to put this color down here. Now I might end up needing a little bit more of that actually. Let me put a little bit more down. Um, and next, I'm going to use a little bit of plate oil. Now, how much plate oil to use is really dependent on how stiff the ink is. So if I look at this ink, it's, it's kind of stiff. Uh, so I'm going to add a little bit here. You can always add more, but so I'll just put down a little bit and I'm going to Mix this up. I'm going to add a little tiny bit more. And I'm going to add a little bit more. So now it's kind of almost like a watercolor, isn't it? You see that? Yeah. Okay. Very, very nice. Yes, it's very thin. So I'm now going to take that. And when you're doing a, um, uh, a, something like this, this is called a glaze plate. Once again, when you're doing a glaze plate, you really want to try to have, uh, try to use the largest sprayer that you have available to suit your plate. So this plate is eight by 10. I have a six inch sprayer for this that I'm going to use. And I'm just going to start rolling this out. You want to keep going like this with your brayer so that you get consistency. So you can see that it's slightly transparent, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm going to very, very quickly spritz my paper.
okay. And now I'm going to take this glaze plate and I'm going to put this glaze on it. You see how light it is now? It's very light. I wanted something to add just a little bit of a punch, but not be so loud because it's sort of a very quiet type of image. So now I'm lining that up. Actually, I'm going to move this because it's got a little dirty. Is the glaze plate translucent? It's almost kind of, yeah, kind of translucent -y. Kind of, kind of transparent-y, translucent-y. Oh. Okay. Now see, if I was doing this on a, on a press, I would do it face up, because then I could place it exactly where I wanted it to. And if I was working in a bigger space right now, I would be able to really be quite specific with where this was going to go. So I'm quickly moving this around. So again, this is another way to create a multiple drop. So look at what happened. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, that's great. Isn't that lovely? I love that green color. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. See how it works to harmonize the whole piece? Yeah. I love doing glaze plates. I think they're very effective. So you end up with something different than what you originally started with, but something that can be very, very beautiful and really transform your print. Now, I think what I'm going to do is since since we had this one, which was much bolder colors, but sort of similar, um, I'm going to dampen this one. And I'm going to show you something else. I'm also going to add more of the glaze to this plate because I want to put it on this other one. See, so you can print a lot of different um, monotypes and you know determine which ones you like as is and then use some of these methodologies to create a plate, uh, I mean, a finished piece that may be more pleasing to your aesthetic. Now, this one is the same size, so I don't need to really do a lot of measuring here. Although I see a little spot here that I want to even out. Okay. So now this is going to go face down. Okay. Thank you. 
so then look what how this print was then transformed. Well, that is the coolest thing ever. Yeah. It brings everything together. It uh, makes a huge difference. So see, you have so many different uh, opportunities to do different things. Um, So let's. So glazing let's now. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, glazing is done at the end, uh, or um, can you do the glazing first and then put the other prints on top? Yes, you can do the glazing first. I have done that in the past, uh, in particular when I was working with some very um, detailed solar etching plates. Uh, I I and I wanted a very large. Um, a plate of color uh, that would act also as a border for the more intricate designs that I put in the center, um, okay. almost like a mandala type of an idea. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, you can absolutely work that way without any question whatsoever. Um, now, with a piece like this, Let me just show you something You can also take a piece and using a little bit of water, excuse me one moment. using a little tiny bit of water, I can take a piece of rice paper, which I have here, which you'll be able to see. Okay. And I can um, I'm just I'm just lightly dampening some areas because I, I want um, I want to tear the rice paper. Rice paper is extremely strong. And as we know from many of our Asian art studies that it holds up for centuries and centuries. Um, so, but it does make it simpler to tear it if you're looking to create a more organic shapes if it's slightly dampened. So I don't have any preconceived idea about this. I'm just kind of tearing some shapes and seeing what I like. You can also dampen the edges. And pull some of the edges to make them a little bit more ragged. Changes up the, the fibers of the rice paper. And then you can see if you want to add some of these to your print. Now, rice paper comes in many, many different colors. I'm using one right now that's 
um, off-white. But I can play around with where I might want these to go. It makes it like a collage. Yes. It. Well, I know you were very interested in in knowing how to add collaged elements to your print. So this could be one way for you to do it. Uh, you can you can use, uh, I, I like to use a, a, an acid-free glue. Uh, there's one made by a company called Line Co. that's quite nice and it's not expensive. And you can just put a little bit here wherever you might want it and pat it down. Sometimes what's nice on a print is, you know, if things are even going off, off an edge, adding some dimension to the piece. Would the drying paint adhere the rice paper to it or do you really need the glue? Well, I like to use either the glue or if you have like um, a matte medium that, you know, that will work very nicely as well. And so, you know, you can add whatever, whatever you like to create a little bit of added textural interest and you can keep building, you know, you can do a little bit at a time and decide, oh, I really, like that or no, I really don't like that and, and come back to it. Um, what you can do also, I, I will be back in one quick minute. <clears throat> so, you can, you can put that before putting the plate. Can you put your collage on the paper and then go with the plate and the paint on top of? Of course, yes, of course. You know, you can create your own sense of process order. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so I'm just going over this with a brayer. Now, if you notice that in some parts here, I'm gonna bring this up close to you. On the part that's right in here, right in here, mm -hmm. it's almost become a part of the paper because I, because I was using the brayer on top of it here and I added a lot more glue in this area. Now this area here, right here, I purposefully did not put a lot of glue there so that I could show you that, you know, you can leave areas that have little parts that are more three-dimensional, like here too, see? Mm -hmm. But when you do, when you do put it down, it, it can very much become a part of the paper, particularly if you're using a, a press it's it's almost indiscernible really uh, and this process also uh, is referred to as chinacole which in french loosely means collage so so that's how you would do that now you know aside from rice paper that comes in many different colors there's also uh, this is a thai paper that um, I used for a book that I did. Uh, this has actual natural leaves and so forth built into the, the paper. This is a papyrus type of paper. You can see some of the fibers on the back side. Um, this is a paper that I would not recommend getting wet. Uh, this is good for collage elements. It's also good to do a monotype on, so long as the monotype is, um, 
you know, heavy with ink, you don't have to wet the paper. You can use dry paper. And uh, this is a this is a Canadian paper by a company called Saint Armand. Um, it's a beautiful handmade paper. I've used these for monotypes as well. If you see, this has an awful lot of texture. Mm -hmm. Now, this paper I find is quite good uh, for using through the press. Um, what happens when you put this through the press is wherever your plate is, the paper loses all that texture. So you gain all of the um, design and, and detailed interest in the area where the plate is, but then the texture remains around the border, which makes it quite lovely, almost like a, a, a picture frame when it hasn't even been framed. So it's just, um, you know, these are a few different types of papers uh, that you can just jump can... in to give you guys a uh, like a 15 or so minute warning. It's 11 okay. right now. Okay, good. I've been keeping my eye on the time. I moved things up a, a little quickly so that we could fit everything in. <laughs> so um, I guess Nancy, you said it's um, it's called uh, Ginocle or G Gicle? No, Chino Chinocole. It's C H I N E, and then there's a hyphen, and then it's C O L L E. Okay. And what is okay. Gicle then? I beg your pardon? Gisle. Gis, oh, Gicle? Gicle, yes. A gicle is um, a gicle is just a uh, a print that's printed out on a color printer. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, in fact, it's it's a tricky kind of a thing. Um, you know, there are people who are selling prints called gicle prints, and uh, you just have to be very careful as a collector when you're buying something that is a gicle print, uh, because you, can, you have to know that they can print thousands and thousands and thousands of them. So, um, you know, you don't wanna pay a lot of money for a gicle print. Unless it's signed or... Well, even if it's signed, somebody can sign thousands of them. You know, unless they ha unless it's an extremely reputable print editioning a gallery like Pace Gallery, Pace Prints, um, whereby uh, the artist has a very strict edition of maybe 12 and, yeah. um, and then they either archive or destroy the image so that it can't be replicated again um, because otherwise, um, you're taking a chance, I see. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, in my opinion. I mean, there are a lot of digital artists that create G clay prints, uh, which is great. And there are many very, very beautiful G clay prints. Um, and now they're using archival inks, uh, which is terrific. I know even myself with my photographic work, I make archival, uh, photographic images on handmade paper. Um, most of mine are one of a kind, but I do have a couple of series that are very limited edition, uh, uh, an edition only of five or an edition only of 10, and that's it. I, I, even as a printmaker, I don't edition my work. Um, I just never really had an interest in, in doing that personally, which is kind of funny because it's antithetical to uh, the history of printmaking, whereby the whole idea behind um, artists creating prints was that they could do an edition of 30 or 40 um, and sign them and have an artist proof for two or three or four, um, because it would be less expensive than someone paying $20,000 for their painting, for example. So 
Um, it was a way for artists to generate income and, um, and that was why they did it. And of course, further back in history, as we know, uh, you know, printmaking was the beginning of, of books and newspapers and all of these sorts of things in a different capacity, of course, not as artistic per se. But um, so that's what that is. Uh, so I, I think right now I should ask you, do you have any um, specific questions related to some things that you have worked on uh, throughout our few weeks together? I don't know if you've had time to actually uh, create a lot of prints. Um, I know Martha, you had emailed me with some questions uh, related to your work that we had spoken about e via email. Um, and I hope that those were helpful. It was terrific. I, yeah, I really appreciated the uh, time you spent with your very thoughtful replies. So it was it was great. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. No, it's my pleasure. And I, you know, and I understand that when you've never done printmaking before, the amount of information um, that we've discussed over the past three weeks is quite a lot <laughs> and, um, and a lot to take in. Um, and we have a short period of time that we're trying to, you know, offer you as much practical working information as, as possible. Um, but certainly you can feel free to email me as you're going along if you have any other questions. Um, Fareshta, what about you? Were you able to create any works? Um, yes, I'm still, um, you know, experimenting. And um, what I love is that the possibilities are just infinite you can absolutely you can do so many things and you can go over your work i mean with painting uh, especially watercolor it's you're very limited you know if you make yes it, you could ruin it but with this you could just go over it and just do other things i i love that about it and um, i really enjoy it i thank you so much and corinne also in bruce museum for um for organizing this. I always wanted to take printmaking, never, <laughs> never managed to get, you know, um, get it together to attend in one of those printmaking places. And this was fantastic. I can't wait for the recording. Uh, oh, well, that's, well, that's great. Well, we're, we're so happy uh, that we were able to get you excited about a new process to add to your art making endeavors and um, uh, you know the more you experiment with printmaking the more fun you're going to have and um, it really is such an exciting way to work and um, and it can become an extension of your other work you know uh, as a painter I, some of my paintings take a year to create but yet I can also create a body of prints to accompany that in an exhibition that, um, you know, will round out my exhibition without taking me the same amount of time, but yet um, the process also yields a little bit of a different result. So, um, so it's interesting for the viewer to be able to see that process differential as well. And um, I'm sure that you will all find the same. And don't forget that you can also, once a print is dry and you've gotten it to the point that you think you want it, uh, you can also add further embellishment with um, Caran d'Ache, uh, water-soluble crayons and uh, colored pencil. And uh, I mean, the list goes on and on, pen and ink, watercolor, whatever you may like to do. So, um, so I was very happy. Paper. You, can, you, can, you can use, for example, ink or crayons on the paper that you have used to print. You can go absolutely oh, okay yes absolutely and and that's one of the reasons too why i like i'm partial to using the oil because um you know anything can be worked over it without disrupting what is already there 
Um, but I, I think it's going to be an exciting journey for you all. And it gives me great personal pleasure to introduce people to printmaking because um, uh, I had been practicing as an artist for a number of years before I was introduced to the process. And, um, uh, and it actually changed how I paint a little bit too. So it'll be interesting for you to see how it may change your regular practice. So, so thank you so much.